a one, a two, a you know what to do. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Go on and find me. I don't care. When I got there, baby. Ma Rainey is a film set in 1927 in Chicago in the dead part of the heat, summertime. And in particular, we have several blues musicians coming together to create the sound and in particular to record, I believe, two songs before the end of this day. There'll be discussions based upon race, art, religion, um, and in particular, the exploitation of black musicians by, uh, I guess, white uh, producers, for lack of a better word. To begin, Kevin, what did you feel about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? Um, so uh, it made me sad. Um, I, maybe that was the point. Uh, but, <laughs> um, I definitely, you know, felt the struggles that at least Ma Rainey was going through. Um, since it was about her, yeah. Um, all the things that you um, just mentioned, you know, her being a her, her being a successful entertainer, but still not being able to rise to the level where she deserved because of other people. Um, so, and just uh, I had an appreciation, of course, as a musician, just um, <laughs> seeing the studio session. I mean, you know what it's like to, you know, just just that little piece of, you know, it's it's nice to show how um, some of that looks. Um, I have not, I have not encountered the murders on set. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the other stuff that happened, uh, yeah, uh, it reminded me of the times that I've been in the studio. Um, it, it was, it was just nice to to see that. Um, I think without getting bogged down into the minutia of music and its production, um, so that was that was pretty good. So I, I appreciated that look. Um, yes, I feel, it's, I feel it's an important film. Um, because of because of what you mentioned, because of the things that, that have been brought to light, um, it made, I, I felt really bad for Maureen. It's like it's just supposed to, and really, and and Chadwick Boseman's character too. He he kind of ticked me off at first. But I mean, <laughs> he gets into why he's done the things that he's done, and so and then you learn to appreciate it, you know. Yeah, so that's that's kind of felt. Like. I mean, it was it, um, <laughs> I re I really felt for Maureen and all that she um, had to had to deal with. I mean, it's like she had so few moments where she looked like she was happy, right? Um, but it's understandable. Yeah. Um, so that's, I guess, what I took, what I took from it, just, you know, feeling almost the same weight of what she's dealing with. I mean, you, you definitely felt it. And then when she finally was able to smile or to laugh, you felt that too. Mm -hmm. It was, she was like an onion in a lot of regards because it was a lot of layers with the woman. And I know uh, Black women like this, and that's what made me really appreciate where she was coming from, uh, they have the exterior that's like concrete. You you don't want to cross them. You don't want to have anything to do with them. But if you would only just give a chance to listen to what's going on and where they come from and the different ways that life can kind of shape someone, and especially I would imagine around that time where everything was about your race and your identity and having to prove yourself and having to be respected, although you were getting no respect and although your identity was in shambles in a lot of regards. The way that these musicians came together and the way that they had that bond, the way that they had that brotherhood, even when there was times that they could be enemies, even when there was times that they weren't seeing eye to eye, is something that you appreciate because you have brothers, you have cousins, you have family members, you have friends, you have people at your job who don't always agree. And the way that they fought and the way that they jive talked at times was, I thought, the color of the film. Because when you can just set a camera in one spot and let the four people in the room go back and forth and hurl insults and be serious and talk about women and religion and clothing on down to politics and everything else. It's almost like that barbershop type of um, type of back and forth that really gets to add a lot of richness in each character. Mm -hmm. 
We had uh, four guys. We had Slow Drag, uh, played by Michael Potts. We had uh, Toledo, played by Glenn Turman. Uh, Cutler, played by Coleman Domingo. And last but not least, Levy Green, played by Chadwick Bozeman. Rest in peace, Chadwick. Now, how did you feel about the different takes on each role? Um, Slow Drag, he came in only in times that you kind of needed that bass man who was still older and who still um, had a lot of wisdom to give, but was kind of in the background in regards to some of the other uh, characters. What did you think about, about any of them in particular? Well, um, I, there definitely were, I guess, characters who played like a certain role. I mean, I know like one character would be sort of like the Peacemaker um, one character would be uh, keeping everybody uh, focused or, or right. at least attempting to. Um, I feel the most well-rounded characters, more, the most fleshed out were Valadeus' character. Okay. Okay. character. I mean, I, that, I don't think that's a really deep observation, but mm. um, that's kind of what I felt. Those were the, I think, the best written characters there because it was kind of really about it, was about, it was about those two. Um, so... Um, I didn't really have much of a reaction to the others, except for maybe the functions, as I mentioned, the functions that they um, that they carried out. I like the way that uh, Coleman Domingo as Cutler, in some regards, seemed like he was the leader of just the band players. Now, ain't nobody going to be in charge of Ma Rainey. She's her own entity. But right. uh, when it came to speaking to them as a whole, as a whole there are a lot of times that the person in particular would address him and then he would filter whatever information down to the rest of them. Um, there were a lot of times that you said that he was um, kind of the, the even person in the discussions. There were times that him and Levy went back and forth. And in particular, when it came to um, religion, um, but it seemed like, although he wasn't the oldest in the room, his voice was the most, I guess, bold. Oh. And and um, I appreciated Glenn Turman's character, uh, Toledo, because he almost seemed like a cross between maybe a grandfather or maybe an uncle that I'm sure people kind of have in their family. That type that's, that's wise, but he's also funny as I don't know what. Um, he's got his own beliefs and everything, but when it gets down to business, he cuts all the fuss out and says, let's just get it done. Mm -hmm. It was my man, Levy Green, that was just, <laughs> oh, man. And it's funny because just as I said with Ma Rainey, um, I know guys like Levy that have lived a particular life and who have been dealt a particular hand in this in which it just seems like they they just can't get right. And try as they may, and even in his case with trying to sell the um, the songs so that he can have his own band and everything, he's still in some ways standing on top of his own toes. Um, and it's funny because there's also a connection between how younger men um, think they know it all. And especially in a room of guys of different ages, different backgrounds, who are telling you, you need to listen when it comes to these things that we're placing at your feet and putting in your lap. And he don't want to hear it. And he knows it all. Those guys, you just kind of want to ring. <laughs> you just want to ring their necks, you know. But but it's only out of love because you know that life isn't going to be appreciative of someone who doesn't have what it takes to learn and to adapt. It's like he already had his own mind made up about every single thing going on. And when it's like that, it's just you're going to be hit the hardest because – encounters with people and especially around those times with you know white folks and everything you're not going to tell them what to do I and mean, he had to learn the hard way and it's funny because we'll talk about it later but i knew when he would be turned away by the guy who was trying to buy the songs uh sturdivant i think his name was male sturdivant that um someone was going to have to pay for it and i could see it in his eyes it wasn't going to be male 
it was going to be one of the guys in the band. So, right. Right. how about um, Viola Davis's transformation into um, what many would consider the mother of the blues, uh, Ma Rainey? Uh, I think she was great. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, there are some actors who struggle to, I guess, get into a role. And if they have certain tics, they may carry those tics with them to every role they're in. That's true. That's um, true. It didn't happen here. Um, <laughs> but I, I definitely feel that Viola Davis uh, was Ma Rainey um, in this instance. Um, I think she played her very believably. It was no, no longer Viola Davis. I mean, she, she was the character. Um, right. Which, which I really appreciate. Um, it's, it's really great to see someone, you know, dive all the way into a role because you're not thinking about them. You're thinking about right. you know, the character they're playing. Uh, I think she did a fantastic job. And especially off of her just coming off of um, the other August Wilson property, uh, Fences, mm. which, by the way, Denzel produced this. But mm. Fences, Fences, I think, is extraordinary. And I couldn't believe that they could take another property of August's and turn it into something this grand, you know. The director is uh, George C. Wolf, And I've seen some behind the scenes pieces about how he was introduced to this and how he wanted to bring it to, you know, to the forefront. George C. Wolf said that the film was actually supposed to be taking place in the winter. That is what uh, August Wilson had in the play. But he decided, uh, George, that the summertime and the heat and just the way that Chicago is around that, you know, around that season really added to you feeling the frustration and the intensity and the anger that seemed to build from the second the guys started to have their discussions become deeper and deeper and deeper. Man, what do you think about that uh, that story that Levy told about his mom and dad and what happened with them and how his dad had to kind of, as he put it, smile in the face of the white man and let them think that they got over on them on him and then what he did to kind of even the odds and all. Um, so it definitely gives um, an explanation um, uh, for, you know, his, his behavior, I guess, throughout, throughout the movie. Um, I right. Think what it show what I took from it is, you know, it's, it's, it's the devastation of trauma that is unresolved because I was like, what is his problem with these shoes? Right. It, right. It, it wasn't about the shoes. At all. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was, you know, it's about, you know, he was still carrying things that happened, you know, you know, years and years ago, you know, how he, he and his family had been offended. Right. Um, you know, victimized, traumatized. And without having fully dealt with it, it still drives him um, and his actions and how he relates to people. And he's murdering somebody over a scuffed shoe. Because yeah. it's not it's, it's not about that. So I think that's and, and and as you mentioned, you know, the heat and the environment, you know, plays into, you know, the sense of things just not feeling right. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So I said earlier that, you know, he, he took me off early because I'm like, what is your problem, dude? Right. And, and he, he was he, just he, it come it comes out what his what his problem is. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's the issue is that this this problem, this this offense you know, he, he had, he had never fully dealt with it, still carrying that anger. And right. then years later, it goes and lashes out, not against the people who are further victimizing him, but against random other people. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, before, because the, the man he stabbed, his bandmate. Right. He stabbed, yeah. He his shoe, but yeah. he had nothing to do with his career, not going to where he wanted it to go. It was the producer's fault. But yeah. I mean, just 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 this this anger just radiated outward anywhere, and then happened to unfortunately land on his bandmate. Yeah, yeah. I saw, as I said before, once um, Mr. Studevant uh, refused him and said instead that he would just buy the songs at five dollars a pop. I'm like, as soon as Levy gets back downstairs, something is going to happen, and and it was even as foreboding enough that. I know Glenn Turman's acting, and out of the four, of, out of the other three members of the band, that this is crazy. I'm thinking um, 
the way that I've seen Glenn Turman act, he's going to be the one that is going to wind up dying before the end of this film. I picked that out just as soon as I saw how Levy was so um, like a powder keg at every single thing going on. And once he drew the knife, when it came times for um, the discussion about blasphemy and, and him calling out God because um, of everything that was going on in his own past, I'm like, okay, now that the knife has come out, even though it got put back up, this is going to culminate with something that he can't undo. And it was funny because Slow Drag has stepped on his uh, feet just as soon as he bought the shoes. So it wasn't like, you know, the next person that steps on him, you know, he could have been that way with him if it was really about right. that. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, it it, it it really made you. And Glenn Turman has the way with his eyes to where, you know, Levy is like, stop looking at me, <laughs> you know, as he's dying and he's just staring up at him. I'm like, man, you talking about pulling on them, them heartstrings, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, Levy also had the argument with Ma because he wanted things his way. He wanted the songs to be played, which... I, w- I wonder how you felt, but I actually thought that his version was better. Uh, I mean, it, it was definitely more interesting. I think, yeah. uh, but this this again reminded me of being in the studio and where the when the lines of authority are not clear. Right. Um, you can you can have things where you have these arguments that are eating up the time that you have and and the money that you're spending. I mean, if it's your studio, who cares? Yeah, exactly. He <laughs> right. runs the studio. And y'all are fussing at each other about how the song's gonna go when when I go to the studio, it's like it's go time. It's like you get it done. Right. In 90 minutes, you're out of here. But uh, but again, uh I think it wasn't it may not even have been about the song. I mean, Chadwick Bowman's character was has been dealing with this stuff this yeah. whole time. Yeah. And I mean it's Ma Rainey's song. And he wasn't recognizing that because he was doing what he was doing. But I think that, you know, his, 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 his underlying issues prevented him from moving along and getting down to business versus I want this my way because, okay, but who are you? This, this is your right. song. You, you and everyone else here were brought on for her, but it's like, I want my way. And I, I've been in situations like that before. So it just, again, reminded me of, you know, <laughs> some, some of real life again, uh, we, when it has happened in, in my life, there were no knives pulled. There you go. All, all, all I got. Right. No, no murders, no deaths. Yes. But that, but that conflict, <laughs> and you know, it eats up. It's it's eating up time and money. And when you got other things that you got to be doing, and um, so that that's what I took away from that. Yeah. The um the the way that Ma had her discussion uh, with Cutler was one of the few times uh, besides her lady friend will say that you actually were able to see her genuinely smile and their conversation went from the meaning of music and how music can turn a bad day into a good day to the blues and how um, the blues is relevant in I guess giving you the slices of our very existence with all that we've had to deal with and, and overcome and basically be drowned by. Um, but when she said something to the effect of these folk, these white people don't even like me. All they want is my voice. And so I understood when she held out until the very last second before she's getting in the car to finally sign the release paper. I understand now why she won't start singing until she gets a Coca-Cola, as she put it. <laughs> um, it's because now she's in the power. And when she's down south, it's her say-so. It's where she, you know, she lays the law as she sees fit. But now she's up north. And besides her manager, who had her back a lot, um, and who I think she said had been with her for six years, um, she didn't have anyone to speak for her and the band is behind her. So they're not able to have their voices as large as, as hers. So, I mean, I can understand it. 
even her being outside and you know um having the car accident and the way that she talked to the police officer which everybody else is like oh no <laughs> it almost remind me of um uh, oprah in the color purple when she's out there talking trash to the man and then he talking trash to the lady and then the man comes up and hits her in the head but it's like you're not supposed to be talking like that don't you know um but it it really gave her character that much heart in which you thought maybe she could have been just a brick wall the whole time. But those little times that you were able to see her laugh and even smile and the way that she was so satisfied when the recording was done, it's like, okay, these are the parts that she can't show because she's got to keep that wall up. And I understand it. You know what I mean? Um, so I think, um, what I appreciated um, from, you know, just again, what she was going through was that, um, you know, she had to fight for self-determination. She had to fight for the respect that she deserved, but she wasn't yes. getting. Um, yes. it's, it actually reminded me of this conversation happened a while ago. Um, I saw this interview with um, Nicki Minaj. And okay. she was talking about how she was doing some music thing. And she was disrespected um, just of the preparation that was there for her. Um, mm -hmm. She had come up. She had come up under Wayne, and she was expected to get a, have a, to have certain things in place, like you know, food and and, and you know, water and things like that. Okay. And I think all that she got was like a plate with some pickle slices on it or something. <laughs> so, some yeah. some really really paltry. And it was this extended conversation with her talking mm -hmm. about how look, um, I'm Nicki Minaj. There's a reason why you brought me here. Yes, um, I'm not just some nobody, and you're treating right. me like trash. Not acceptable. Um, it reminded mm -hmm. it reminded me of that. That that's what Ma Rainey, you know, had, she had to fight for. Mm -hmm. What I guess others may just expect to just have. Um, so that was a part that that, that kind of got to me. Yeah. Just how you know she had she had been in this business for a long time. She had worked with this guy for six years, as you said, and she's still not getting the respect that she that she felt she deserved. And, but it also brought to mind, you know, at the end of the day, they kind of they got this perhaps a business mindset. She's singing things, she's creating things that you know come from her heart. And right. I think that's, that's, you know, a clash that, that folks might end up doing the whole, the, the personal side of music where you want it to be authentic. So if it's coming from you, it's gotta, it's gotta be something that you believe in. Right. Versus if you're doing it for a living, there's bills to be paid. And yes. there may be considerations made that may end up altering your vision because it's not bringing the bucks in that are going to allow you to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw that is a conflict between, oh, it's especially over when, um, also when Ma Rainey had her, was it nephew, um, do the intro to the song and because he had a stutter, it, it was taken a long right. time. Right. She wanted that in there. Yeah, at all um, costs. It, it was a family consideration. Yes. You know, and she was gonna have it in there. That's, that's what I saw as part of her vision, her heart for the song. And even though I spoke a minute ago about, you know, wasting time, she wanted this in the song. It's her song. This is how she wants it. And she's going to do whatever it takes to get it done. Forget everything else. Right. And so then that, that's in conflict with, okay, we got, we, got a, we got a limited amount of time. We got two more songs in this set. Um, so just, I, I, I just appreciated that look into what an entertainer might be dealing with, that there's a part that comes from you, but there's also the business part of it. If, if indeed it is part, is part of making your living, that might be in conflict with your vision. Certainly a great point. I mean, that's your, your, your music is, um, it's like your baby. And the way that it's being received and appreciated and recorded and everything is detrimental to everything that comes after it and around it. And um, even as you saw when the uh, engineer, Mr. Um, Sturdivant, somehow messed up the recording and tried to blame it on Levy saying maybe he kicked or I think the manager said maybe Levy kicked out the um the wire she's like I ain't doing this no more because she gave her all into that performance and the way that it was rocking I mean I'm you know dancing and everything and then to have it all pulled from under you and say it was a great cut uh your nephew got it perfect and everything but we got to do it again she's like oh hell no <laughs> and you could see just you know it just it pulled it out of her but somehow that manager was able to lift her back up and get her back in motion every time it's crazy that he had that just that hold 
and I'm sure that that comes from years and years of working with one another, you know? Um, right. But um, then on a side note with something else, you have Levy, I guess, begging to be kicked out of the group or begging to be beat up or beat down or whatever by messing with her friend and her, her girl who she bought, you know? And, and, and everybody in the band is looking like they're holding their breath, like, I can't believe this guy is doing this. And I'm almost thinking that he was egged on by the fact of the reaction he could have got if he was ever caught. And so, again, it's one of those times that Levy is just just doing whatever he can to just up in the whole day. But it's like he didn't start out like that. He started out laughing and joking and then talking about shoes and then talking about clothes and everything else. And that's when he starts to explain that Mr. Sturdivant said that he could record the song the way that he wants to. He doesn't care what Ma has to say about it. And are you really going to sit here and say that when she was going to come in that studio, she was going to be fine with you playing whatever it is you're going to play. And the second she got in there, she was like, what, what's that that's playing? Oh, no, I need to tell Levy, look, he, we, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh here we go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I knew that it was going to happen. I knew it. I knew it. But yeah, um, something about that moment, um, it made me, it made you believe that Ma Rainey knew what she was doing. Yes. Um, because that, that might have gotten over on somebody who had less of a strong will than she did. And right. also, if she had no credibility, then she could say, I want it done my way. And everybody else would be like, Psh, whatever, because you know what <laughs> but uh, you couldn't you couldn't pull that over on her. You couldn't she's get her to, like she's going to she's going to have her way. Mm-hmm. And, and she knows it. Um, so one, once again, I know we've been talking about Javik Bozeman, <laughs> but <once laughs> to, to Davis, for making uh, that believable. Yes. Yes. I wonder. I haven't seen. I'm wondering if she is up for any sort of a um, an Oscar for this role, or is it just Chadwick? Because I, I mean, it became Chadwick's movie. That's that's first and foremost. And when he wasn't on the screen, you were wondering what he was doing, or what he was coming up with next. Um, but I've never seen her with this character, where. In some regards, she in she's kind of like the antagonist, but once you find out that it's because of X, Y, and Z, and you can identify with it, she takes on a whole nother air. And well, so she did get the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Actress in a Motion Picture. Bravo. <laughs> bravo. Uh, yes. Totally, totally deserved. Mm-hmm. Chatwick has a chance of um getting being nominated for this Oscar as well as for uh, the, the five bloods. Mm-hmm. And if so, he will be, I think the only actor ever to have two posthumous, mm-hmm. either two posthumous wins or two posthumous nods, one of the two, but either way, that's, that's, you know, it's a rarefied, rarefied air right. to, to be sick and to have cancer. I'm just watching him, and this performance and realizing the whole time that they had, um, you know, a staff off to the side just in case he would run into some conflict with his health. And there were times that they would have to stop and he would have to go out and be attended to and then come back in. And if you didn't know who he was and just saw this movie for the first time, you would think that he was just an actor. That's the way he always was. You, you, you wouldn't have known anything was amiss. And yeah. that is that's such a grasp, you know, on your ability to emote and to exude these feelings and to just drudge them up and just paint the canvas, so to speak, at at, at any drop of the hat. Yeah. And 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 for someone like him who's gone from Black Panther, um, um, so many different characters that were so powerful to us Mm. to have a character like this be your last in which now I can show you just like um, training day, just like Denzel. I can go a whole other way 
and really make you feel me and really make you hate me at times, but really make you understand the points that I'm trying to make, even if you don't agree to them. And so, you know, that was, that was, that was really good. I just, I wish my boy Glenn ain't had to die <laughs> just to, you know, just to have that, that yeah. point be proven. But um, one more big thing, and, and, I, and I really want your interpretation on this. The whole issue about it being a door in the room that doesn't open anymore. And for some reason, um, Levy being pulled to it so much that while he was just talking and while he was arguing, he would go over to it and try it, knowing full well that it wouldn't open. And then go back over and do whatever and later on come back to it and try it and come back to it and try it and come back to it and try it. And it wasn't until um, he was fired by Ma that he went in there in a rage and kept jerking the latch until it opened. And when it opens, it opens to a room, a brick room, basically leading to nothing. And when he looked up, here's the big thing. When he looked up, the, the, the top of the room was open. So you saw the sky, but it was almost the, like the embodiment of him not being able to escape because it's too far. And so I, I thought that there was some symbolism of that room. Yeah, uh, the way I look at that is, um, well, in, in light of you know what was brought up about his past, um, I, I could I can see that room as representing something that was that was closed off, that was no longer in use and should have remained closed off. But um, and then when he finally opened it back up, there was nothing there for him. Um, I relate that to, you know, again, what I took from uh, that moment, uh, that room, whatever it was used for before, mm -hmm. it had been closed off. He finally, he, he spent quite a while trying to get into it without success. He finally got into it and there was nothing there for him. So right. I, I relate that to how he personally and his family had been, had been victimized, had been damaged. Right. It was something that could have been walled off, but he kept going back to it, especially in the later part of the film. He brought, he brought all, especially when he started talking about it. I mean, right. he brought all that with him. And as I mentioned before, it just made him angrier and angrier. He was doing self-destructive behavior all the way through, um, you know, trying to assert authority over Ma Rainey, trying to take her girlfriend, all this crazy stuff. I think it was related to the, those, the, those hurts that had not been resolved should have been walled off, put away. But he was still still going there, even though he couldn't go in. Still going there, still going there. Then when he finally breaks into this thing, then there's nothing there for him. In, and, 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 and in the film, it ends in him murdering somebody. Because right. all of that stuff has still not dealt with, the anger still had not dealt with. So that's, that's my take on a way to look at what that room represented. It's a great point. Um, and I almost, I was frustrated with him continuing to try to go to it, knowing that it wasn't going to open. It's almost like beating a dead horse. It's almost like trying, as you said, for something that isn't there. So now he's been fired. So now he goes to Mrs. Third event and, and he's not going to give him the money. And, you know, he's not going to give him what he really should have given him because that one song was really good. Even though the band that was playing it at the end was trash. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. But, um, and I thought, just like we were saying about um, exploitation, I thought that with it ending on that note was something that was really um, good for a conversation starter. Because there was a moment like that in the movie, um, The Five Heartbeats, where um, they were having issues with their likeness being on the cover of the album. They were going to put it as like two white people like on a beach or doing something like that instead of the guys. Because it's all about, we'll, we can take your music, we can take your sound, but just not your image. And the way that it ended on that with those guys trying as desperately as they could to, to get an ounce of what Levy was trying to, you know, trying to radiate. Um, it was just, it, it was, it was crazy. It was ridiculous. 
Um, I even thought on a side note before I go into the, the last impressions, I thought the name Levy um, itself, I wonder if August Wilson was going at something underlying there because a levy, just as we were just saying, is uh, something that is built up or that is holding up, in that case, water, in this case, feelings, angst, anger, anxiety, um, frustration, not feeling like you're worth it. And once it breaks, once he breaks, all hell is going to break loose. And so um, that name, whether it was meant to be or not, was perfectly crafted for that character because that's absolutely what happened. So all in all, um, when it comes to directing, I thought that uh, George C. Wolfe did a sensational job. Um, The acting is what held this and what keeps your attention and what would have me coming back for more. Uh, Coleman Domingo really did his thing. Glenn Turman can do no wrong. Um, Viola Davis was <laughs> Ma Rainey. She was the mother of the blues. And um, Chadwick Boseman, Levy Green, that guy, gosh, he's the reason to watch this. He, he, is, he is one of the, you know, one of the highest parts of this whole engine. And so for this to be the last thing that he did is just just an example of what he was going on to do. Um, the script, which I believe had a lot of parts of not the whole elements of the play uh, by August, was superb. There was nothing I would change, nothing I would add to, and nothing I would take away. Um, the rewatchability, as I was saying before, if it were not for the acting, um, would be, you know, one of those things that you throw in if you want to see one of our, I guess, dramas or tragedies. But it is lifted up by the fact of its individual parts. The fifth element, I would say, is a combination between Chadwick and 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 Mr. August Wilson. Um, and I want them to produce many, many more, many more um, of his plays and of his works. So um, I think that uh, that that this has to be highly recommended. I think that that with this being the the, fi- the final piece of Mr. Bozeman's career, I think that by August Wilson living on for decades, I think that by the way that our people were able to produce and to direct and to write and to bring about a work as accomplished as this, it's something that you have to at least see one time. And so if it were for numbers, um, I would be in between nine or nine and a half. I thought that Fences, real quick, I thought that Fences was perfect. And I put this just a step below that. So stop what you're doing. If you haven't seen it, get a chance and check it out. Kev, what did you think about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? Uh, so uh, acting was great, especially um, Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman. Uh, them too was yes. really all the acting I needed. It was it, it, it was it was fantastic. Like I said, Chadwick Boseman's character got on my nerves, but I I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing that's the kind of thing that I can appreciate. Yes. Um, and it's not just you know you know just just because he's a jerk. No no no, there are reasons for this, and they make sense with um, what's going on, what's ha- what what has happened, and what is happening. Uh, so that made sense. Um, didn't have issues with the script, although it's funny how, um, like, the phrase they would say, I ain't studying you. And I've heard that before, but it's not oh. something that folks around my, I'm out around my way say. So I was like, huh? But the way that the characters, when they said it, right, they were able to, yes. in the contempt that that phrase actually conveys, they were able to do it. So yes. Like, okay, because they kept saying it, and then <laughs> around about the fourth or fifth time, I was like, "Ooh, he, he, he told her, she told her." You know? <laughs> and I think that's like a southern thing because we yeah. actually use it all the time. And, okay. and and you know, my wife being from Georgia, she <laughs> at least once a day she ain't studying. Studying, we go from saying "I ain't studying you" to "I ain't studying you." Right. But she there ain't studying is. this person or this guy, this woman or this whoever, and it's like. It's just right in my lexicon, but that's funny yeah. to hear <laughs> that. It, it, it took me a moment to get it, 
Right. But, <laughs> but again, the actors fully inhabited their characters. So even if it was a phrase that I don't use a lot, I guess being a city person, I guess. Um, <laughs> I got it. Right. Uh, so, right. So, so, that, so really no issues with the script. Uh, the plot was great. Um, I always appreciate when plays are converted into movies, but they still look like movies. Yes. Just like plays. Yes. So, um, and, you know, this one had very few locations. It was the studio and you that know, back outside. room. Yeah. That back room, and that's it. That's it. But everything that was in there made it fresh. And it was, and it was, it was good. I, that, that was really, really great. Uh, some other categories. Rewatchability, I would watch it again. Um, I, I, as a musician who's been in a studio, I got a lot out of what they put in there. But again, I don't feel it was overloaded with like, you know, jargon that only a music head would get. So right. that was fine. Um, and I thought that you would get a kick between... out of, um, I thought you would get a kick out of Branford, uh, Branford Marcellus being the mm -hmm. composer of all of the music. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I just wanted to throw that in. Keep it going. <laughs> it yeah, thank, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for that because um, yeah, the music, the music, the music did work. Yes. Um, so my my fifth uh, category, um, just um, as I had said, um, what happened with Chadwick Boseman's character, um, with his his decline <laughs> from yeah. beginning to the end, um, right. it was uh, done very well. And after I stopped getting angry about it, <laughs> uh, it, it made sense in context. So uh, I, I would put it together. Um, I would say I liked it. Um, it was a very good film, very important film um, for all the things that we had uh, mentioned before um, and should resonate with pretty much everybody. So that's how I felt about it. Outstanding, outstanding. Ladies and gentlemen, how did you all feel about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? How did you feel about Viola? How did you feel about Chadwick and the rest of the cast? Uh, hit us up in the comments and let us know. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And hit that like button if you haven't already. Continue to uh, stay with us as we stay with you. Coming up soon, we will be covering The Five Bloods, which will put a one and two on Chadwick's uh, final two performances. So stay locked and loaded with that. We have more to come next time.